Uh, so I am a computer scientist and an artist, and I like to use origami as a kind of platform to explore both sides, and I wanted to give you a couple of examples of that. Um, so here are two examples of some of the state of the art in paper folding. I guess they're now uh, seven years old, but uh, these are each folded from one square of paper, no cuts. Yeah, <laughs> pretty crazy. Uh, and these are designed in part using mathematics. This would not be possible without our mathematical understanding of origami. An example of something we know on the algorithm side is uh, this system called Origamizer. Uh, it's freely available software. You can give it a 3D computer model like that bunny in the top left. It will give you this crease pattern, which you can fold from a square piece of paper. It takes about 10 hours if you're good. And you get this model. Perfect. Exactly what you want. So this is automated origami design using mathematics to design a new sculpture. You can also go in the other direction and use sculpture to, de to design new mathematics. Uh, so here's an example of taking a circular piece of paper, folding along concentric circular creases. This is a model that goes back to the Bauhaus in the late 20s. When you fold it, the paper self-folds into this 3D form. It's really cool. Paper just wants to live in this form. And what we would like to do is harness that self-folding power to design uh, self-folding, um, I don't know, space stations, buildings, anything you want, you should be able to self-fold. Now, we don't have a mathematics for doing this yet, so we explore the sculpture side as a way to see what is the design space, what can you do by self-folding origami. This is taking three of those concentric circle models and combining them together. Uh, this is a whole bunch more, maybe uh, 15 or so uh, circular models. This show is, is up right now if you want to check, check them out. It's up until Sunday at the Fuller Craft Museum. Great museum. There's a bunch of origami on exhibit there. Uh, so we're exploring the sculpture space to try to understand uh, the mathematics of self-folding. Uh, a different kind of self-folding is building a robot that folds itself into the origami. No origamist required. Uh, you just send a little bit of electrical current, and this thing folds itself into your table. Whenever you need one, then you can unfold it and store it as a sheet when, you're, when you don't need your table. Um, ideally, you'd have one robot that could fold into many different shapes. And so we've designed this uh, simple crease pattern. It's a grid with alternating diagonals that can fold into any shape made out of little cubes. And so uh, that same sheet can make any 3D shape you want. So here's a version of this robot. We, to make any shape, you need a very fine grid. But you can imagine this little gadget can self-fold into, uh, it can unfold, refold into a laptop, or into a chair, or into a boat, or a car, or whatever you want. Here's making a boat, probably even floats. Uh, so you, that's the same sheet. You send it one signal, you get your boat. You can now turn off the power. It will hold its shape, because there's little magnets there to, to keep it in place. Or you can unfold that sheet, send it a different signal. It'll fold these two creases, the first two folds in a paper airplane. And there's a little, uh, it's called shape memory alloy, little uh, muscles pulling the creases shut. And you send it a third signal, and it'll fold the last two folds in a paper airplane. Now, this sadly will not fly, but uh, <laughs> we can make it thin enough, small enough. This is already getting pretty small. But you imagine a big sheet. In the future, in, instead of just downloading the new software for your iPhone, you could imagine downloading the new hardware for your iPhone. And uh, I'm told we're getting paid $1 for every second we go under time. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so. So I think some, there's some strange paranormal effect in Cambridge. Doing big ideas year after year, we're speeding up the lecturing <laughs> process, and our lecturers are getting faster and faster. I don't know where this will lead. So while you all we go, think about your questions, I have this image of the IKEA of the future. You know, that's that, yeah. that's that store that sells you the self-assembly furniture, where it seems so easy in the store, and you get home, and then you start saying things that your mother told you not to say because it won't go together. Are you imagining furniture of the future that just folds itself or constructs itself just when you get home? plug it in or put it in a battery and yeah, it just makes itself. And then ideally you could reuse that furniture. So you say, oh, this couch wasn't big enough, maybe you plug in a little add-on, but then it reconfigures into a couch twice the size. Right. Or T into say, a bed. Say more about the, the world of the future with self-constructing 
uh, devices like well, this? In the future, what we'll are you have, hoping to achieve? We'll have transforming robots that can take on any shape. You know, they can be like a humanoid or a car and I take over we, the world. I thought we had that already. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's really exciting. I mean, the, you, you can s reuse materials in a, in a totally new way if, uh, and, and you, if you can refold them. So what, what's your, what are you most interested in? Are you most interested in, in advancing math? You talked about how you might be able to find spaces where there would be good theorems by looking at the behavior of origami. Right. Or are you most interested in some fantastic technological future in which uh, we don't have to do any construction? <laughs> That's a tough one. I, that I, mean, is I think indeed a wonderful probably future. personally I'm most interested in the mathematics. That's what I'm good at and that's what I enjoy doing. But I, I read a lot of science fiction. I really I want these things to be real. You know, I want I want the Star Trek replicator. I want the transforming you, robot. You believe him, don't you? You can see. <laughs> right. So please. it's a bit of both. Actually, I was thinking of IKEA too when I when I saw your presentation. So I just wonder, do you know, like, do you have any other vision of uh, use in everyday life, like? Do you imagine like every human being using something like that in some way or the other sooner or later? And uh, also, could you imagine other materials than paper? Yeah, uh, I, I hope that in the future this will be, I think robustness is probably the biggest issue. It's all fairly cheap, fairly easy to manufacture. Uh, so I think there's, there's a decent market and the only challenge is making it folding all the time perfectly. But when we get there, I think everyone would want something you can store in this nice uh, flat form, and then whenever you need some crazy 3D shape, you just plug it in or download the new shape or whatever. That's the hope. And e already this is not being folded with paper. It's various layers of plastic and metal to do the electronics and things like that. So yeah, it works there too. Over here, please, next. Um, I'm curious about the mathematics. You're, you're describing a tie-in between these three-dimensional objects and the mathematics. For example, the dragon. Did you fold the dra was the dragon folded first and then a mathematical model developed to describe it or was the dragon developed through a mathematical model that allowed you to follow instructions to fold it? I'd say more the latter. Essentially the, the artist uh, Satoshi Kamiya came up with the concept of a dragon, plugged that into the mathematics, uh, figured out how to fold sort of the rough outline of a dragon and then did the art, the art side of making it look like a dragon. Incidentally, that model took about a year to fold, I'm told. A year to fold? Yeah. Right. Off and on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think, yes. Um, please. Um, the uh, paper circle that was self-folding, how does the material of what you're folding affect how different shapes self-fold? Uh, the, uh, for self-folding to work, you need some kind of elastic material. Uh, so paper is elastic. You know, if you, if you curl it a little bit and let go, it flattens back out. It wants to stay in that flat state. But then when you crease it, you change the memory in the paper. You, you go past the yield, and then now the paper wants to stay bent. And it seems any material that has those two properties will work with self-folding. So would having the um, creasing, uh, changing the memory of the material affect the robotic folding at all in the material? Uh, yeah, I mean, in particular, if you're changing the memory, that's not a reversible thing. So if you want a robot that you can reuse multiple times, you, you can't use a material like that. Uh, but there, there's applications for that. The IKEA thing is you assemble it once, maybe you never disassemble it, or you throw it away if you're going to move. It's not, <laughs> it's not the best way to go, but it would be a start. And with, if you're just going to use paper, that's probably the best way to go, because paper is kind of disposable or recyclable. But I think much better is to use something that can fold and then unfold later. Are, are there um, biomedical applications of this? I mean, many macromolecules self-assemble, and their three-dimensional shapes are crucial to their properties. I mean, could you start tinkering with macromolecules this way? Yeah, it's something we're looking at. Ideally, you design, say, a protein that folds into a desired shape, so it kills uh, all the bad diseases and doesn't kill you. Okay, That's thank you. That's the direction we're going. Thanks. Thank you.